Hi, everybody. So welcome to uh, Chapter 3, Asia in the 19th Century. So in the two previous lectures, we talked about uh, a kind of broad overview of traditional Asia uh, from country to country. Although, again, we just hit the highlights there. And in the, in the context of an Asian American history class, we, we can't go into the depth that would really nice to. And I recommend taking a Chinese, a Chinese history class or a Korean history class or a Southeast Asian history class or Japanese history class to really have a much better, deeper grasp of these Asian nations' history and their cultural beliefs and their achievements in a much deeper. But for the for the purpose of our class, though, we're keeping it kind of simple. But again, you can't understand the Asian American experience and all its complexity unless you have some working knowledge of the the backstory, the origin story, the culture of origin. And so we're going to continue that with uh, Asia in the 19th century. Now, significant to this is we kind of get the, the farther back history, cultural, worldview uh, perspectives of these various Asian regions, East Asia, South, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Uh, but now we're going to drill into a little more into the more immediate context of when large-scale immigration from Asia begins to occur and the conditions in Asia that drive that. And that is going to be spurred by the European arrival in Asia. You don't have Asian immigration to uh, the Americas uh, prior to the arrival of the Europeans in Asia. So that's that's the game changer, making the world smaller, and more interconnected, is the European uh, contact with Asia. Now, part of that involves imperialism and colonialism in Asia, which profoundly influenced Asia both in the 19th and 20th century, and we'll see that even in later lectures when we get into topics, for example, like the Korean War, World War II, um, even back to World War I, uh, and obviously more even more dramatically, the Korean War, of course, and then uh, the Vietnam War and the conflict in Southeast Asia, which really spurred large scale immigration. So we'll return to what's going on in Asia. The purpose of these uh, next uh, two lectures, though, is focusing on. Uh, the 19th century and into the earlier part of the 20th century uh, was taking place in Asia because that sets the groundwork for the first large scale immigration from Asia to the Americas. So, okay, so let's take a look. And we're going to start off with China and we're taking a look from China from around the year 1800 to 1914 as the context for uh, what's taking place in China um, that influences the the first large-scale immigration to the United States, which would be the Chinese immigration, really starting in the, the the gold rush era and then into the railroad era. So what's the context and background to that? So let's take a look. So now back up a little farther, as you guys know, I mentioned that it's the context of, of Europe reaching out to Asia in the first place. Now be initially the Portuguese, the port Portuguese looking for a route to Asia, eventually rounding the, the, the Cape of uh, uh, could hope in uh, Cape Horn. <laughs> That's been a long week. <laughs> Rounding the Cape of Africa and eventually arriving there in Asia. And over time, beginning to ruthlessly dominate the trade in Asia itself and the trade to Europe. That begins with Bas Vasco da Gama and many others who are uh, in the process of working their way to Asia. And there's a whole variety of products in Asia they desperately want. Pepper is just one of many, as you guys know, pepper, cloves, cinnamon, a whole variety of spices that make our food more delicious, uh, more aromatic, all kinds of trade goods, and realizing this could be very lucrative and helpful to Europe in many ways. And the Portuguese, the first Europeans to really begin to seriously do this. You see some of those early trade routes and a contact with both India and then farther into today would be Southeast Asia, all the way into uh, Japan and Korea eventually. And you can see those early trade routes again coming out of Portugal, working all the way around the coast of Africa, and then getting into India and into Southeast Asia, and ultimately all the way into uh, Japan and China as well. So this is going to start a beginning of a monumental uh, transformation in Asia that happens slowly at first, but will gather, uh, gather a speed as Western political ideas, cultural ideas, economic ideas, military strength, all begin to force Asia to re-examine fundamental traditional beliefs and begin to shake Asia in some way. Again, it starts slowly at first, 
but gradually gather momentum and cause eventually major transformative changes within Asia. Now, Asia that's being contacted in this time period uh, varies greatly. There's a great diversity within Asia, as you guys know. For example, in East Asia, you have old, highly developed, literate monarchies in China, Korea, Japan. Um, and to some degree in Southeast Asia, you have some of that too, a place like Vietnam, for example. Um, we also have a, a highly developed, literate monarchy as well, too. Not to mention India, having highly developed societies there, wealthy, powerful, sophisticated societies there as well, too. Now, if you get into some portions of Southeast Asia, depends what we're talking about, those areas tend to be a mix of some parts quite developed, other parts not so much at all. For example, the Philippines. The Philippines is a big mix. Some parts of the Philippines um, have a, a certain level of colonial development, other areas uh, do not. Same thing for much of Indonesia. Australia, New Zealand, other places in Asia that uh, have um, a much less developed. For the sake of our class, though, we're not going to get into Australia and New Zealand, even though it's a great part of Asia, but it's not going to be part of really the Asian American experience as we see it, because Australians and New Zealand, on the whole, are going to be of a European extraction. Although both those have indigenous populations, and these days actually a significant Asian population, Australia and New Zealand, too. So again, that gets more complicated. If you have an Asian ancestry from New Zealand immigrate to the United States, then you will be part of the Asian American community. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna move quickly through that. You guys are familiar with the spice trade, and I just you guys I just mentioned that to give you guys a little bit of background to what's coming up. So, bringing civilization, modern modernity to Asia. So. When the Europeans arrive in Asia, um, they progressively introduce Western concepts across a broad range. Christianity is one of them. Christianity, Christianity does come with uh, a whole variety of very impactful uh, repercussions. Some of them, frankly, are quite positive. Others of them, depends how they're implemented, uh, could be viewed certainly negative by the indigenous cultures of Asia. It, it depends dramatically where they are. It depends also who's doing the propagation of Is it, for example, is it voluntary? Is it intentionally respectful of local culture or trying to bring a Christian worldview at the same time? So it probably varies, frankly, from culture region to culture region, also which church or organizations bring Christianity, what is the culture of those missionaries, um, what is the impact? So uh, it's a very to some degree. So in some areas in Asia, it could be quite positively impactful. For example, oftentimes Christian missionaries would bring in education with them, modern education, which would be vital to uh, 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 westernization within Asia. But it also could be, um, depends again on who's bringing it in and the missionaries involved in it, it could also be uh, coercive or uh, disregarding and disrespectful of local culture too, depending on the content. A uh, more efficient Western style government without traditional corruption, ways to Asian style governments could be, and again, could be because that's complicated, and I want to be careful with that. Because when you're a colonial administration, there's a lot of exploitation goes on too. But there also can be some positive aspects of Western style government as well, too. So it's kind of can be a, certainly a mix. Modern science, for example, arriving in Asia, bringing about monumental changes in how things are done. For example, modern medicine agriculture techniques, etc. Um, Western culture, individualism, rights, and to certain as Westerners would see it, barbaric practices into slavery in some cases, uh, a more universal respect for the law, again, within the Western context. So, um, but that's certainly how the Westerners would see these things, right? So I'm trying to give more about this, but that's how they would see it. In their time period, they would see all these, this list of seven things, all of them are a positive. Peace and de facto strife, that's how they envision it too, that we're sometimes bringing about, uh, for example, in a place like India, where there are certain regions that have a certain level of chaos or anarchy, we're bringing peace and stability and law and order. Economic development, certainly how the Europeans saw things, both of themselves, but they'd also probably argue for the Asians itself too. Introduction of modern consumer products. Now again, that list is primarily how the Europeans perceive themselves. Now, its impact in Asia is going to be more complicated, certainly. 
especially it depends on are these things brought in with coercion to force to colonization to imperialism and oftentimes the answer to that would be yes okay uh, let's move on to china and talk about what's going on in china so china during this time period is toward the later part that's last major chinese dynasty which is uh, the qing dynasty sometimes called the manchu dynasty so you can use manchu or qing either one of these it was is one of china's great dynasties but during this time period this is in the 19th century into the early 20th century when it finally ends it is beginning to weaken and fall on hard times additionally to make it more complicated uh the qing manchu dynasty is actually not an ethnic chinese dynasty they're actually from manchuria so although in our Western eyes may seem Chinese, technically the last Chinese dynasty or Qing or Manchu dynasty is actually Manchurian culturally, ethnically. They're not technically Han Chinese. So in the Chinese eyes, they're a foreign dynasty, even though they speak Chinese, in many ways they appear in general, at least to Western eyes, to be Chinese. But this last Chinese dynasty is not Chinese at all. It's actually Manchurian. It's a foreign dynasty over China. So they're both trying to maintain the control of China as a foreign occupying force, although they are from Asia. Uh, but they also have major challenges coming from the growing power of Westernization uh, in warfare, threats of colonization, Westernization, all which they're grappling with. That map shows you the size of the, uh, of the Qing dynasty of China, which is quite large, and you can see, including, for example, the control of Tibet. Now, they didn't actually tightly control Tibet in that time period, but they certainly claimed Tibet. This map right here shows you, though, part of what is on the horizon. Now, this map, I mean, this, this cartoon, I'm not mad, this cartoon you see in front of you um, has some problematic elements to it, but still, it's useful to certainly how the Europeans viewed this in this time, as the Qing Dynasty, although great and wealthy and powerful, but is weakening. And now you have an invasive set of this, uh, ambitious, excuse me, <laughs> an ambitious set of European would-be colonial powers, by the way, including the Japanese too. So if you look at this cartoon here, you can see them. This, light, this lady right here represents Great Britain. That gentleman, as you probably can guess, represents uh, Germany. That gentleman right there might be a little harder for you guys. If I, you guys are in class, I'd ask you, but anybody have a guess that? That'd be Russia. This lady would be France, and this person right here would be Jap Japan. Uh, Japan, in this case, in the form of a samurai. Again, there's a little bit of issue of stereotypical representation from this time period when this cartoon is made, but it shows them with this like pie dividing up China in the, in that era. It's not quite that simple, but there is some, and you can see the Chinese Mandarin, and this again, he'd be actually Manchu, or Qing Mandarin government official, throw up his hands in alarm that was taking place to China. Despite this cartoon having some stereotypical issues of representation from the era, it is useful with the truth of that. There is a great deal of truth in that, which is European, our, uh, European powers and Japan looking at China, salivating, thinking it is a part of this pie we can carve up for ourselves as China weakens. All right. I'd like to give you a couple of brief examples of that. We'll, we'll move, try to move quickly through this, but the Opium Wars be a big part of that. So. I'm going to try to make this really short and sweet, but Great Britain is trade to China, afraid of the outflow of gold and silver to China to buy all these uh, luxury, although I'm not sure tea's going to be a luxury in Great Britain, probably a necessity. There's a whole series of imports of uh, things that Great Britain desperately wants from China. Tea, <laughs> porcelain, silk, etc. And in the early trading days, there was not much that China actually wanted back from Great Britain. So they didn't want to trade good for good. China's like it. So if you want the tea, which we know is great, and you want the silks and the porcelains, etc., fine. But you're going to pay in cash, cold, hard cash, gold and silver. Long story short, and to make it a more complicated story briefer, um, Great Britain desperation begins to look about, worrying about the outpouring of gold and silver to China. Is there a product that we can import to China that Chinese would actually like from us in these early years? In this case, in the in the nineteenth century, and somehow, tragically, for all involved, uh, Great Britain does find a product that they think that the Chinese would happy to trade for that is not gold and silver, and that is a drug. <laughs> in this case, opium. 
Now, again, there's a long story here, but we're going to make this quite short. Great Britain begins to ship mass amounts of opium, grown, by the way, in India, primarily in India, in the Indian subcontinent, grown in India, and then exported to China. And China develops a national addiction to opium. Opium was not great, brand new, but its availability and its relative cheapness makes it a drug of choice. And yet many wealthy Chinese men who fall under the addiction of opium. Opium is the kind of drug that you should be becoming addictive, uh, addicted to it. It's something you'll do all day and you'll smoke opium all day and it is a life destroyer as most addictive drugs are. Um, it becomes such a problem, such a widespread social problem in China, eventually the Chinese government feels that the importation of opium has got to stop. It's become a major social blight or ill inside China. And I will go in the, the play by play of this. I'll simply say, um, there's pushback from Chinese officials, pushback from the British. Ultimately, Great Britain feels that they've been disrespected by China. The China, when the Chinese government officials blew, uh, burned one of these major uh, warehouses full of British imported opium to China and refused to pay for it. Great Britain was already carrying a certain level of frustration dealing with the Chinese red tape and bureaucracy, even trading with China. And now this conflict over drug, the drug opium, fuels British resentment that China is being unreasonable, hard to deal with, hard to negotiate with. But some of that is partially true, especially historically prior to this. China sometimes was very complicated to deal with trade-wise. And there's a lot of protocol you had to go through. Great Britain feels tired of that. Now they feel insulted and financially damaged by this rebellion against the use of opium, which they've invested heavily in. And this is actually lead to uh, two wars called the Opium Wars. The first of them takes place from 1839 to 42, the second from 1856 to 1860. I'm not so concerned whether you guys know the dates. We're not going to break these wars down. I just want you to know Great Britain and France, who joined the second one, fairly easily win these two wars. And there's two of them. The first one did not settle all the issues. The importance of this is China is humiliated in the, both these wars. China loses both these wars, which, which is important in the context of our class because of China, a great sophisticated civilization, but in the modern era is now dominated, at least in the short term, by European power and humiliated by European power and forced to swallow and take a deep breath and accept a certain level of unfair, unequal treatment by European powers following the end of these two wars. I'll give you an example of that. So in the second war, angered by some of the fighting, uh, to teach the Chinese a lesson, um, the British and French army, as they get to Beijing, decide to uh, fall on the execution of some British and French envoys, which are killed by the Chinese military. To punish China, they decided to teach China a lesson by burning down what's called the Summer Palace. You guys are probably familiar with the Forbidden City, that massive palace in Beijing. There's actually a second version outside the city called the Summer Palace. Also massive, extremely opulent. And to teach Chinese a lesson, the British and French armies burned down the old Summer Palace, which was massive. There's some examples of what some of the buildings looked like in their heyday. This map right here is kind of hard to see it, but you guys see this this big mural right here is showing you the massive extent of Summer Palace, most of which was torched by the British and French army that day. Now, not entirely. They didn't burn down all of it. They burned down large portions of it to intimidate and teach the Chinese a lesson. The takeaway from, for that for you guys is simply that uh, you can see the Western dominance over Asia, um, a certain level of also condescension, um, and in destruction of, of traditional Asian culture. In fact, burning down this massive opulent palace. They didn't burn out all of it, it's significant amount. It shows you uh, Western frustration and a certain level of disrespect uh, with Asia. And also the conflict too, because China's not, there's two sides in that coin, but it just shows escalating conflict, both culturally and nationally, and Europeans' dominance of the conflict. China, following this uh, humiliation, will shortly after go through a terrible rebellion called the Taiping Rebellion. Now, this was an internal rebellion, which I'm not going to break down. I just want you to know it's an internal civil war 
that, have, that attempts to overthrow the Qing dynasty. Ultimately, it'll fail. I want you guys to know this is terrible stat. 20 million Chinese die in this internal civil war. How that significant to our class is China's weakening and chaos and destruction is going to worsen the economic conditions of many Chinese peasants and others who are looking for an escape from the devastation China's in and maybe in fact feel, feel that China war ravaged both by the Opium Wars also by the Taiping Rebellion that maybe there's better opportunities abroad in this case we'll get to that with the next lectures in this case in the United States. Uh, feel perhaps that there's not, not much chance for any kind of economic improvement um, in the chaos that China's been going through perhaps it's, it's worth the risk to cross the Pacific Ocean and try our economic luck in this developing country, United States, because conditions in China, for, for them at least, for these individuals, are not good. China does, through all this, attempt to modernize, but it's not easy. As you guys know, China has a very large, proud, rich culture, an innovative culture, a creative culture, both scientifically, artistically, uh, philosophically, etc. So, as China finds itself weakened and humiliated in the 19th century, it causes a tremendous amount of soul searching in China of how do we deal with this? Do we modernize on the Western model or not? And that's a, it's an ongoing struggle within China during the 19th century into the 20th century. An example of that would be what's called the Boxer Rebellion, which broke out in 1899 in China. It's a, what's called a popular uprising. It doesn't mean all Chinese supported, but many of the low class Chinese and middle class Chinese did. They fear the impact of the ever increasing Western culture and economic and political power in China. But China is not typically not colonized, except for Hong Kong and Macau and some other places. But China feels that Christian missionaries and business practices, Western military support is growing ever more powerful in China. There's resistance to that, there's resentment of that. And from 1809 to 1901, there's a major uprising in China that attempts to expel all foreign Western culture. Christianity, Christian missionaries, Western style schools, any kind of aspect of Western culture, there's a push to have expelled from China. This leads to more warfare. Quite a few Europeans were massacred during the, during the Boxer Rebellion, forcing European, not forcing, but European powers respond by sending Western armies to protect their positions in Beijing and the place in China and to crush the Boxer Rebellion, which ultimately they do. The point of that, again, for our context is China is continuing to go through convulsions and stress as they're grappling with what it looked like to be a modern nation. And you see conservative elements in China who are dead set against that. The following the Boxer Rebellion, China again is by fits and starts is attempting to modernize and partially is. But China is a huge country, so you have conservative elements that do not want to modernize in the Western method. And then you have young Chinese who feel like we have to. If we're going to be part of the modern world, we have to adopt Western science and technology. The quicker, the better. Even Western economic systems, social systems, we have to quickly adopt these to keep up with the ever-changing, rapidly evolving modern industrial world. In this case, primarily the West. All right, that's the context for uh, China. Let's move on to Japan. Japan also, in the 19th century, to go through a major dramatic shift in some ways similar to China, but Japan will more quickly and more successfully be able to navigate that road to modernization. So let's take a look. So Japan has been confronted by the modern industrial and insistent West. I should put a comma in there, I think. Modern and insistent West. As was China. Uh, Japan, like China, fears large-scale colonization. There's an internal struggle in China over how to react to this Western uh, threat. And in Japan does something that China was not able to do nearly as efficiently as Japan. Following that internal struggle, Japan is going on a crash course of rapid national modernization. There you go. And it will do so quite successfully. Now that's all the more amazing because when the U.S fleet arrives in Japan in 1854 under Commodore Perry, um, Japan is very much in a time warp. And I won't go into that too deeply, but Japan, already fearful of the intrusion of Western culture, 
had really, really limited the impact of Western culture uh, in Japan um, for the last two centuries. So Japan already quite fearful in trying to protect Japanese traditional culture had largely closed the doors on Western culture, with the exception of a one island off Nagasaki, which they allowed one Dutch ship to come a year to trade with Japan, but it's quite limited. I get fearful Western culture, what that means, Christianity, thought system, sciences, which Japan felt would be a would lead to a destruction of Japanese traditional culture. So in 1854, when the U.S. fleet pulls into Edo or Tokyo Harbor, uh, to establish trade negotiations with the Japanese, the Japanese are stunned and highly alarmed because these American warships are vastly more modern than anything Japan remotely has in, by comparison. And this causes an existential crisis for Japan, or what are we going to do? The Americans are insistent we begin to trade with them. The American technology is probably 200 years, or at least 150 years, in advance what Japan has. The Japanese who look at the situation realize with a shiver that <coughs> their attempt to hold off Western culture is going to fail. And that means likely that could Japan be colonized? Japan is aware of other Asian nations who are being colonized in this era. They're deeply worried about that. Um, and they're worried could that happen in Japan? That they realize that militarily, despite how brave the Japanese soldiers may fight, how brave the samurai may fight, that they're going to fail in an attempt to preserve Japanese culture intact as it has been. So it turns into a major internal struggle. What do we do? Some Japanese, like the only, the only reasonable course is rapid industrialization. We're going to have to study Western science, education methods, social organizations, technology, etc., we're going to have to rapidly incorporate those in the Japanese, in the Japanese society while, while maintaining as much of core Japanese cultural values and culture as we can. So to try to, to marry what on the best Japanese traditional culture with also modern technology, modern science, and so forth, and Western political systems. Of course, that's not easy to do. It's going to lead to conflict, internal division. And there's plenty of Japanese who felt that that's going far too far, that we lose our Japanese-ness, our, our whole identity as a people. That's going to lead to a, a fairly intense internal struggle in Japan over what to do uh, with this crisis. Should we double down and remain traditional Japanese, or should we modernize rapidly to meet the challenge the West is posing to us? There will be quite intense fighting in Japan, but ultimately the forces of modernization will win the internal warfare. And Japan does that. They go on a crash course program modernization. And they're quite successful, remarkably successful. So going from the 1850s, when Commodore Perry arrives in 1854, uh, by the 1890s, which is a scant 30-some years, Japan goes from being a quite closed traditional Japanese society to a rapidly modernizing industrial power. Now, it's still developing. But the change is extraordinary. They do that through obviously a lot of very hard work and intense effort. They get sending a lot of Japanese students study abroad, bring back the best Western techniques to Japan. They also bring foreign experts to show them how to do things. Um, and they learn quite quickly, quite rapidly. So much so that in uh, 1894, Japan will fight a war with China over Korea. Um, and Japan, having more, much more quickly modernized in China is going to relatively easily defeat China in this war for dominance over the Korean Peninsula, which we'll get to uh, shortly. Here's a picture shows you again how rapidly Japan is able to modernize. On the left here, you see Japanese admirals taking the surrender of the Chinese fleet. These are Chinese admirals. Notice they're still wearing traditional Chinese clothing. Although the Chinese, are, again, they're trying to modernize too. These European imperial gentlemen here in the background are European advisors to the Japanese naval captains and admirals. So the Chinese are, of course, they're also trying to modernize, but the Japan is able to do it more rapidly and more efficiently and more effectively. This shows execution of some Chinese prisoners uh, during the war. By the way, this is also an important moment because it shows you what is going to be a major feature of Asian American history, both then and now, which is 
Remember, Asian American is a new term, which is sh showing the many Asian Americans in contemporary America feel uh, a unity with other Asians in the American experience here. But when you get to nation of origin, of course, Asia is a region, but that does not include, obviously, good relations, closeness, right? And so many of you are probably aware there's deep tension in many Asian nations with each other because, of course, they have complex histories. There's warfare. Um, there's winners. There's losers. There's colonization with, within Asia. In this case, it's showing you the tension historically between the case of Japan and China. And that would also carry over into the Americas. Now, in the Americas context, because, again, that's not the dominant narrative here, that's mitigated by the American context. But it does play a role here as well, too, of how the Asian, uh, Asian American communities have, through most of U.S. history, identified above all, for example, the Chinese American community, the Japanese American community, the Korean American community, etc., Indian American community, etc., the Filipino American community. Um, and so when they look at those things, when they look back to Asia, they don't look back at Asia as like we're all Asian. They look back to Asia, of course, to their nation of origin and the complex history of Asian origin and how they view other Asian nations within that context. Okay. So uh, Japan, uh, by the turn of the century, the 1900, Japan has become a powerful industrial, in this case, even colonizing dominant power within Asia which will play a major role, obviously, coming up to the next station. We're talking about Korea, Taiwan as well, and not to mention World War II, which get too much later in the semester, uh, the internal dynamics within Asia and how that affects the Asian American population here. All right, let's move on to Korea, and that's going to be the, the last topic for this uh, lecture one. We'll get to uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia with the next lecture, but let's get to colonization of Korea. So, uh, Korea, like Japan, uh, was deeply concerned to preserve Korean traditional culture, with the, which of which they're justly proud, not surprisingly. Um, that worldview sees China as a center, as it did in Japan too. Um, so the intrusion of Western practices, science, technology, worldview, etc., was viewed in many Koreans as a tremendous and profound, even existential threat to Korean traditional culture and ways of living, life, and perceptions. So as it was in Japan, as it was in China, too. So uh, there's a fear of what that means as resistance to this Western onslaught. Korea, like Japan, centuries earlier, has essentially closed its doors on Western contact. Again, fearful of it, fearing, fearing what it represents, Korea tried very hard to limit any foreign contact with the Western world. And by the way, had done so quite successfully. And then they had to close doors. And as a mindset, frankly, most East Asians. But uh, Europe was insistent and not waiting. So Europe begins to try to push and interact with Korea, although they were not as focused nearly as Korea as they were in, as say, Japan and China. So the European attempts to force Korean trade relationship were much more tentative and really didn't go very far. But Korea increasingly feels itself. Uh, threatened between what's taking place in China, uh, modernizing expansion of Japan and various Western powers, for example, Russia, for example, who certainly is eyeing the Korean Peninsula as well. Korea feels quite nervous and uncertain with its position, realizing that technologically they are far behind the West and all growing increasingly far behind Japan as well. Again, that combined with their traditional view of China as a center and fearful of departing, again, like, I don't know who I'd even be if I'm not focusing on China as a center of culture and so forth. You know, again, we're proud to be Korean, but China has been our great culture source. And now you're saying China is fundamentally wrong about science and culture and political organization and, and education. It's immensely hard to swallow that. And many conservative Koreans are not willing to do that. Now, there's a, a whole group of younger Koreans that, just like in Japan, realize this has to happen, that the world will not wait for us, that the world and the, the dominant, scientifically advanced, militarily powerful West is not going to wait for us. And so we're vulnerable that we have not developed and modernized, so we have to do that. So Korea itself begins going through internal conflict of, do we modernize, do we remain traditionally Korean, 
all while that's going on, you have powers around them, Western powers and also Asian powers, seeking to uh, control and dominate the Korean Peninsula. I think for time we'll go through all this, but there is various conservative resist resistance movements within Korea trying to keep out all foreign culture, just like we saw in Japan with the boxer movement, just like we fall, saw in the internal fighting in Japan prior to the Meiji, Meiji Restoration, where the Japanese are also fighting internally of do we modernize or not. And that happens as well in uh, Korea. Now, unfortunately for Korea is Admiral Perry, who uh, forced a crisis on Japan in 1854 when that powerful U.S. modern war fleet arrived there outside Tokyo, uh, tell the Japanese no, knock on the door and say, we want to trade with you, we're not going to take no for an answer. Unfortunately for Korea, especially since my, my family in Korea too, from a wife's side of the family, um, Korea did not have a similar aha awakening moment like Japan did. So Korea tragically, in a sense, slumbers in isolation longer. When Korea begins to really begin to wake up, by the time they wake up, they're already even farther behind the game technologically and militarily and scientifically, and they're even more vulnerable. They're not as big as Japan, the population is quite a bit smaller, and they're farther behind. And that means when Russia comes calling, or maybe European nations, or in this case, a rapidly modernized Japan, Korea is quite vulnerable because they do not have a modern army, don't have a modern economy, um, and now they are feeling like they're uh, a fish in a barrel between a variety of fishermen all aggressively looking to claim their uh, carcass. There's a split in tide Korea, how to react to all this. Uh, this lady right here, her name is Queen Min. She's one of the last, I guess, I suppose perhaps the last queen of Korea, although maybe not technically. Well, no, the last uh, queen of the Korean dynasty. That's her husband there on the left. Um, No, that's not her husband. In any case, <laughs> uh, Queen Min was very close to China, and, and which, by the way, is a true and Christian view and wanted to maintain close to China even in this era of crisis. The Japanese are increasingly look to modernize and colonize on the Western model of Korea itself. Japan sees Korea next to it. Japan, following the Western model and also its own ambitions, uh, sees Korea as weak, vulnerable, non-modernized. Japan, by this time period, has largely modernized. They fear Korea could be colonized by the, the European nation and maybe be a threat to Japan. On the flip side, if Japan were colonized Korea, that would be good for Japan economically with the resources and also protective of Japan as well, too. So Japan in this time period decides to add Korea as a colony to Japan. Now, Queen Min is dead set against that. Eventually, the Japanese realize that she's an impediment or obstacle to any plan to colonize Korea. They send some Japanese assassins and they murder her in her palace. Koreans to this day think bitterly back on having their queen murdered by Japanese assassins as the Japanese in the process of trying to colonize Korea. There's much more to that story, but eventually that is what's going to happen. The Japanese would ultimately colonize the Korean Peninsula. If you're curious about this very dramatic time period in Korea where they're losing their, their sovereignty, losing their nationhood in this case, under Japanese colonization, there's a Netflix uh, series I recommend to you called Mr. Sunshine. So I highly recommend it to you guys for extra credit. Um, historically, it's pretty good. Now, it does follow some fictional characters, not surprisingly. And its storyline obviously has fictional elements to it. But it does give you a good sense of Korea attempting to modernize while still also maintaining traditional internal struggle in Korea and the growing Japanese power in Korea along with American, Russian, and other nations also their presence in Korea too. All that combined with the struggle in Korea to modernize or maintain traditional society, what that looks like. And you can even see that here in this uh, still from one of the uh, screenshots from the series because you see this guy right here is a young Korean gentleman wearing a Western style suit. We're quite modernized. Same thing for this Korean lady right here. She's wearing a modern European style fashion. Now, the kind of heroine of the story, she's wearing a Korean traditional uh, clothing that's called a hanbok. That's what she's wearing, which is Korean traditional clothing. This guy right here is actually represents a Korean American soldier. Ironically, he was a real person. Now, the storyline of Mr. Sunshine is largely fictional, but this guy actually was. He was Korean American. 
and did return to Korea as an American soldier from the U.S. government, but having Korean ancestry and actually had been born in Korea. This guy right here is where is dressed as a samurai. That's also historically pretty good because the Japanese power and influence in Korea ultimately in the colonization is also taking place as well. And that took place in 1910 when uh, Japan formally colonizes the Korean Peninsula. And Japan colonized Korea from 1910 all the way to the end of World War II in 1945. Japan's colonization was quite harsh in many ways as they exploit Korea for the benefit of Japan, just as European colonization of other Asian nations is also exploiting and could be quite harsh and destructive local culture. And we'll see that with, for example, the French colonization of, of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, the, the British colonization of, of India, and other places as well, too. So, uh, let me give you a little bit of a feeling what that colonization looks like. Uh, this right here in downtown Seoul is a contemporary picture of Kyungbuk Palace, which is one of the most important royal palaces uh, in Korea to the day. If you guys visit Korea, that palace should be on your to-do list. I don't know how they took that picture with no one inside, probably before the gates opened for all the throngs of tourists come and take pictures. Because I've never been here when it looked like this. <laughs> it's full of people. But uh, that does give you a sense of what the, this is a courtyard in front of it, and that's where the king would sit when he has uh, formal audiences with his subjects or foreign dignitaries. In Korea, that palace has become a symbol of Korean national pride. Uh, but you'll also see here in a, in, a, in a moment, it's also became a center of, of Japanese colonial oppression and what that looks like. So. There's a few more views of what that Korean palace would have looked like in its heyday. That's what it looked like. You see, that's the building you just looked at, which is right here in the middle. You see a bunch of other uh, uh, palace buildings. In fact, this entire structure right here would all be part of the imperial palace in Korea. Now, compared to a Chinese palace, it's much smaller. Compared, to, for example, for Vin City, it's pint size, but it's actually still quite good size. As you see here, it's still quite large. Now, this is what it looked like. Uh, prior to Japanese colonization. But when Japan colonized Korea in 1910, the demonstrators to the Koreans who were really in charge, they built this brand new western style building right in front of Kyungbuk Palace. If you look really closely, you can see the eaves here of the traditional Korean palace right here. Most of downtown Seoul is in front of this building. So if you were a Korean walking by this, you could not even see Kyungbuk Palace back here. All you'd see is the new Korean government general building, that's where the Korean uh, governor of Korea lived, the colonial governor lived, and where the administrative offices were, were in this building. Thus, the Japanese demonstrating, we are the new power in Korea. Your old traditional ways are gone. Much of Kyungbuk Palace was actually torn down by the Japanese. They did not tear down a few buildings, fortunately, but most of them were uh, dismantled and destroyed by the Japanese in this time period. So, again, if you were in downtown Seoul, say, in the 1990s, you would see a traditional gate, which would have been the entrance to the palace. But right behind it, you still see the Japanese government building, uh, governor general's building, which, by the way, after, the, after World War II, the Koreans had used that as a government building as well. Eventually, they converted it into a national museum. So when I was uh, teaching ESO English in South Korea back in 1990 and, uh, and Bible when I was there as a missionary, uh, I visited that building as a museum. Now, eventually, though, in the, in the late 90s, the Koreans are like, why do we still have that building there? It's blocking the view of our remains of our palace. Uh, the Japanese built that there intentionally on purpose to hide our culture and our governing power. Why do we still have that building there? And they tore it down. That photograph you see on the right is a bunch of scaffolding there as they're blocking the view of the de demolition. And today, if you visit South Korea and you go to this gate right here, that building is completely white clean. Instead, today you see uh, the, the downtown Kyungbuk Palace as it was back in the day. So there's a contemporary photograph. Actually, it's my photograph there, getting ready to walk through the gates into the palace compound today. This photograph was taken back in 2018, I think. <laughs> Look back, think back now when I, when I was there. And that's the, the palace today. Uh, they are, by the way, rebuilding a lot of the buildings that have been destroyed during the Japanese colonization. Back in the turn of the century, a lot of buildings are being rebuilt today. But that is the main throne hall you guys saw there in the earlier photographs. 
Today would be a ton of tourists there. Uh, you can go and rent Japanese, uh, sorry, Japanese. You can rent Korean traditional uh, dress, which is called hanbok, and take pictures there. So you see, I don't know whether these are actually even Korean. They could be, but they're wearing Korean traditional dresses, and they're taking pictures there uh, with the palace there in the background. That's my daughter back in the day, to, back in 2018, there in front of the palace. There's my family cramming in for a picture. I think you guys saw that maybe in my first lecture, too. Uh, and walking around that palace. And again, if you guys are in Seoul, it's on a must-to-do list. Go check it out. And walking around that palace uh, today. My point of putting all this stuff in there, though, is, and again, that's kind of the heart of Korean culture being revived and then badly damaged. So, so why does that matter, by the way? In the context of, of the Asian American experience, why does it matter what's going on in Korea? Well, Korea is beginning to enter into a very difficult time period, right? So from, nine, well, even earlier, but from 1910, 1945, there is no independent Korea. Korea is a Japanese colony. So the beginnings of the Korean American population will actually come to America during that era of colonization because they can actually be free. They can talk freely and, and press for freedom for Korea and the Japanese colonization because they can do that freely in America where they could not do that in uh, Korea because they'll be immediately arrested, likely executed, at the very least in prison, perhaps tortured by Japanese colonial authorities. But in the United States, though, as a Korean, a small minority there, but you can freely advocate for your country back home for South Korea. In fact, the first Korean president, which we'll talk about a little bit later, he'd be in the United States in this era, working as education, also campaigning to try to uh, free Korea from Japanese colonial control. There's some picture, pictures today of a recreation of uh, of a traditional Korean military guard in, at Pyongyang Palace, which they have on certain days of the week. If you're ever there, you can go take pictures of them as they're parading there in their traditional uh, uniforms of, of the Korean uh, military back in uh, the Joseon Dynasty. All right. There's much more to that story, both with Japan as well, too. Uh, and also, you mentioned Japan modernizing, too. Uh, it also obviously played a major role in the Japanese early immigration to the West Coast, too. Uh, as Japan's going through that dramatic modernization, there still is not necessarily easy for many Japanese people on the lower end of society to thrive in a new environment. They also look for opportunities in the West, in Hawaii, which we'll get to later, and in the United States as well, too. So that's the context for East Asia, China, Japan, and Korea in the 19th century into the early 20th century, and the context of beginning early immigration from these areas, which are coping with war, major social change, uh, westernization, sometimes enforced upon them, colonization, a lot of dislocation uh, taking place there. And you can see people looking maybe for a way to uh, start a new life uh, in this it's sometimes chaotic, dangerous, uncertain world in their home countries in Asia. So with that, we'll stop right here and we'll see you with the next one we get to South Asia and Southeast Asia.